Hi, this is Manish Pandari. I'm the founder and CEO at GrowthPal Technologies. So, uh, Manish, what is GrowthPal? Can you give a like an elevator pitch of GrowthPal? Sure, uh, Akshay. Uh, thanks for having me here. The uh, GrowthPal, we have built an uh, M&A platform for uh, small to mid-sized companies. And uh, essentially, we help both buyers and sellers find each other. And uh, so, so take a use case of a buyer, uh, say, from, from U.S. looking to acquire smaller companies in India. And uh, so we take their requirements, uh, you know, specific use cases. And for those, we find the best uh, targets they should look at. So we are not an investment banker in the sense that we are not driving the entire transaction execution, but we are the sourcing engine. And uh, so today we have created a fairly large uh, set of buyer demand. And now we're starting to work with the, uh, uh, the sellers as well to help them identify the best buyers. Okay, interesting. So uh, you are a discovery platform, essentially, like where buyers can discover sellers, although it's not exactly that self-service where I go and I apply some filters and I uh, can directly, it's not like that e-commerce kind of a search uh, no. platform. No, no. Okay. It's okay. it's like you you tell us what your need is and we get you the best 20, 30 uh, companies that you should look at. And that we do it through the entire uh, data on these companies. So we have a very large uh, data set, over 3 million companies in our target markets. And uh, for the, uh, the buyer's requirements, we would go through that entire universe of data and find the best companies that we, we feel are fit for the buyer. And at which point we speak with the, the sell side founders as well, because of course uh, their consent is very important. Uh, their intent has to be aligned. And only then we, we share those uh, profiles uh, with the buyer. Why not? Uh, okay, so uh, I come from the world of recruitments. Uh, my bread and butter comes from running a hiring agency. This sounds a lot like a hiring agency where in my case, my buyer is a employer who wants to hire someone and then we identify talent uh, based on what their requirements are and then we speak to them. And uh, and what we do is more like an investment bank where we earn on successful transaction, which means the person joining. And that typically has a much higher fees than only a, lead gen so why why are you why are you only doing lead gen why not earn through success fees also because i'm sure success fees would be like maybe 20x of what a lead gen fees would be uh, right so we uh, uh, so we do charge a finder's fee because we want to make sure that we are providing uh, the leads which ultimately close right uh, so that buyers also have the comfort that uh, these leads are likely to close and uh, therefore, our business model is split between a uh, subscription fee and a uh, finder's fee. Uh, but like and interesting you say about uh, recruitment. So uh, it is actually very similar from a actual uh, outcome point of view. But one thing which is very different here is that uh, we are dealing with extremely discreet parties. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, especially the sellers don't want to give any signal to anybody in the market that they are likely to sell, right? And for that matter, even buyers don't want their uh, strategy to be publicly, you know, available. So how do you make a matchmaking and a, and a very contextual connect happen uh, while being extremely discreet? So, so that is the nature of the problem, and that's where we have excelled in... Uh, achieving that while still uh, finding the best targets. And uh, what is the, uh, so you said subscription. So it means that someone pays you for a full year, even if they are only doing one transaction a year or how, how does that subscription work? Yeah, that's right. So it's generally most clients pay for the year. We have taken uh, like six months subscription as well. But uh, so first of all, the, uh, uh, the acquisition is, is an activity which doesn't happen in a day, right? From starting with the defining your strategy, start looking for the right uh, targets, start talking to them, 
and as you talk talk to them your own strategy gets more refined uh, not everybody you talk to even if you like them is not going to necessarily result in a deal happening so it takes uh, its own time and uh, second part is that uh, most buyers we speak with uh, they want to keep looking in the market even after they make an acquisition they don't want to stop even if they're not ready to uh, uh, do an acquisition right away they still want to be in the market they want to know what's happening uh, find the right uh, candidates whereas uh, um, uh, this is more for smaller companies they mid to larger companies uh, they sometimes have multiple acquisition threats going at the same time they have a full and fledged com- yeah go ahead sorry please finish your no so they have full fledged cop dev teams um, where they can handle more than ac- one acquisition at a time and even when one acquisition is going through the due diligence and uh, final lawyers uh, the getting the documentation done they they could still be looking at uh, leads for other requirements uh, your fees is the same irrespective of how much work whether it's a company which has a cop dev team which is doing multiple acquisitions in a year or if it's a company which is doing one acquisition in a year how do you uh, how do you align uh, your efforts with what you are paid uh, so very interesting so uh, the subscription is uh, it it uh, it's higher if there are multiple requirements that we are working on uh, multiple in parallel so number of our clients have uh, uh, anywhere from 3 to 5 requirements at a given point in time right and then the another dimension is that they may do multiple of the same you know requirement right but uh, so we do have a variation in the subscription fees but the finder's fee which we charge once the deal closes that is uh, dependent on the size of the transaction so you know both ways it kind of justifies the effort understood understood so it's like uh, if you have one deal open uh, you will there will be like a base subscription for one deal open at a given point of time and if companies want more than one deal open together then they have to go for a higher tier subscription or something like um, that they can have multiple uh, uh, deals open for the same requirement but sometimes they have uh, uh, you know let's take take an example of say an it services company now uh, they may say that uh, you know i want a company for uh, cloud migration sure. and at the same time they're also looking at a, a, a high end data science uh, company uh, and they may say that oh and by the way i also want a salesforce company now these are three different requirements and we can service all three in parallel and each one of them can have multiple leads uh, uh, because we don't know which one they are going to likely pursue so we will share uh, uh, you know a handful of uh, good targets that we believe for each of the requirement and then as their management uh, talks to them they start deciding which ones to pursue okay and just and what would the subscription range from like uh, like a broad range like from this to this annual so uh, since we have uh, subscription we are charging to, to the buyers uh, it ranges from 24 to 36000 a year so about 2 to 3000 a month okay 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 understood and uh, why do you give the numbers in dollars are you a us focused company or uh, like what is so your we have uh, yeah we have global customers so today we have uh, so we actually generated good amount of buyer interest so we have buyers from of course india but uh, us germany uk netherlands singapore so dollars is kind of the commonly understood uh, currency currency so mm. yeah and uh, these are all buyers who want to acquire companies in india or are you a like a global platform uh, we are a global platform however um, all of these geographies they are looking to buy in india as well uh, mm-hmm. however recently i think last 9 months we have closed two transactions where both the buyers and sellers uh, are in the us so yeah okay 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 interesting okay uh, you know because i am from a somewhat related field of recruitment so a 
couple of challenges which we face come to my mind. Uh, you know, often there are like unrealistic expectations or the client may say, I want to acquire a company like this for between 30 to $50 million. And you would feel that, okay, this valuation is unrealistic and you will never find someone. And yet you cannot say no because you're charging a subscription. So how do you then manage these cases where uh, you have to service them and yet their ask is unreasonable? Amazing question. And I'm, I'm kind of uh, intrigued that this uh, is there in the recruitment as well. Uh, yeah, so we is, actually, it is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So actually, you'll be surprised how you know you can find uh, similar things in very different uh, domains. So mm. we actually tackle this in the sales process itself. So before we actually take on a uh, client, in generally in the in the first call itself, or definitely in the second call, we ask them their expectations that uh, how are they seeing the valuation or what is their uh, you know acquisition budget versus the the revenue that they're they're looking for the you know the acquiry company and uh, in that conversation it's a very uh, kind of an open conversation and we tell them what we think that what is likely to happen um, and uh, if we feel that the buyer is uh, kind of way off the what we see in the market we do not uh, take those clients uh, because in this case uh, when we are talking to a sell side company uh, there's no guarantee that the uh, the current buyer that we are suggesting for them is likely to close the transaction so we don't want to also kill their relationships with the potential sellers even if you're not charging them right so we have to be very realistic with respect to and respectful to you know you don't want to go to somebody who is perhaps uh, expecting, uh, you know, a uh, hundred dollar value as per the market. And we tell them that, hey, no, you're worth only $10, right? Uh, that is not, uh, you know, how this, this should happen. So we, we educate the buyers. Uh, some buyers are very mature. Uh, some we have to educate. Uh, most of them do listen. In fact, uh, those who are not very experienced, they do ask us that what is the, you know, what is expected. Um, once in a while, we find cases where they are just very unrealistic and they seem very aggressive, and we tell them that sorry, it's uh, unlikely that this will work. Mm. Okay, okay, got it. And uh, what do you charge on success? Your uh, finder's fees. So um, th- there are also you know some uh, nuances there, but generally speaking, around one percent of the transaction value. And this is, uh, how does it compare to what an investment bank charges? An investment bank would also do something similar, except they would do the whole nine yards of uh, yeah, sourcing so they, till closing. Uh, uh, correct. I'll, I'll qualify that. So the uh, investment bankers generally, depending on the size and uh, geography, it's uh, 3 to 4%. If the transaction sizes are very large, uh, it sometimes can go down to 2%. And if they, they are too small, they can go as, as high as 5%. Um, now, with respect to the what we do versus what investment bankers do, um, so what we do, we already talked about, we are best at sourcing the right targets. Investment bankers are generally not best at sourcing targets um, because most investment bankers, and if I were to pick a number, I would say perhaps uh, as large as 95% or more, uh, represent the sellers. So ah, a banker okay. representing, let's say, two or three sellers at a at a given point in time, those are the only targets they will take to as many buyers. Now on okay. the buyer side also, it's generally where they have they know that such and such buyers have perhaps such need, or their analysts can do some Google searches, right? So it's not very methodical the way we do it through data where we are scanning the entire universe. And we have, uh, so our secret sauce is we spending a lot of effort in building both the demand side and the supply side. So we can do effective uh, matchmaking. Um, now, you can't do that when you're purely working on relationships. Your relationships will take you only so far. And today, especially in the tech domains, uh, there are uh, buyers and sellers all over the world. Uh, let alone your own city or your own small region. So, yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Understood. That's an interesting insight. So typically an investment banker is looking for buyers more often than not. And so they would use the networks and whatever to send feelers to multiple potential buyers. Uh, Correct. And you're mostly doing the reverse of uh, helping buyers to find the right acquisition targets. Yeah, so we have done mostly the reverse uh, so far, uh, which is the given a buyer, find the best uh, targets uh, to acquire. But now we are starting the reverse as well. And uh, we see that as even a larger market. Uh, but we wanted to first um, uh, solve the demand side of the problem. So, yeah. Mm, okay, okay. And uh, so your, uh, uh, you said 3 million companies in your database, right? So how, how did right. uh, that get built? Uh, I'm assuming that would be like a key asset which you have built over the last four odd years. Uh, yeah, so yes and no. Um, data is like the, the necessary ingredient. Uh, and uh, to be honest, I think there are probably, you know, a uh, number of uh, players in the market who have a similar kind of data. Where our secret sauce is the... Uh, the building the models, algorithms, uh, mapping the clients, uh, the buyer's requirements to what to look for in a, in a sell-side company. And uh, second part is that there are data points which are not available on companies because these are all secondary data that we all are after, right? That's all we can pick up in the market or from the internet. So how do you derive certain numbers uh, or certain parameters which are not available online, right? So we build a lot of models to do that. And, uh, and lastly, because we are a very discrete platform, so even when we show the, the targets to buyers, uh, these are shown on a blind basis, right? So even after we have spoken with the sell side founder and they, they think that this opportunity is very interesting, and we take them to the buyer, buyer still doesn't know who the seller is. They will right. see like, this is the turnover, this is the uh, areas in which they operate, uh, these are the markets right. where they are operating, this is the employee headcount, things Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. So we mm -hmm. call it a blind profile, right? So that's okay. what they see. Only when they show serious interest uh, that, yes, now we want to get on a call with this company, that's when bo we tell both the parties who they each other who each other is. Right. Uh, which is so, your way of maintaining confidentiality. Absolutely. So, and because we do that, uh, the, the sell side also tells us enough information about them. Uh, because without that, uh, positioning them to the buyer is not uh, optimal. Right. Hmm. Uh, whereas you'll find there are plenty of other platforms out there in the market uh, who have a lot more data than us uh, from the number of companies. But like it's a, a very general. Right, that there are traction, VCCH, CB Insights. There are lots of platforms mm. uh, globally, but they are general purpose platforms, mm. right? They're servicing lots of different needs and they are as good as public because anybody who subscribes to them can search through all of the company's data, right? We don't mm. sell data. Even mm. our own clients, when they have subscriptions, they cannot see any company on our platform, right? It's only what we want to show them and that too through a blind profile initially, and only when both parties are have given a consent, then we share the name. Mm. Okay, okay, okay. In interesting. Uh, tell me the journey of building this. Uh, I'm still curious to learn how that 3 million uh, companies database gets built. Uh, and while you are saying that it's easily available, but uh, for an outsider, uh, it sounds like a right, massive number. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. So actually, there are a lot of um, uh, techniques to to go and scrape data, and uh, there are a lot of platforms that provide APIs. There are uh, platforms where data is available where you can go and uh, give me some examples, you know, like like a Zoom Info or those kind of which sell yeah, uh, company yeah, data to salespeople. Absolutely, we 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 have pulled from I think more than sixty different uh, data sources. Um, and in some cases, we even take paid subscription. And, but we are very clear that we'll never sell data, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the data is very safe with us. And even the sources from where we are taking the data, uh, there is no threat to them because we are not competing with them. Uh, we are mm -hmm. not packaging and selling this data, 
right? We are only deriving insights to uh, get to an outcome, which is for MA, right? Mm. So, uh, so, that's, so besides uh, these uh, platforms which sell data, what, what are the other sources? Like, is, is there like a MCA, like these company yes, filings? Yes. Uh, so, they, correct. Those are available? Like, uh, Yes. So, but MCA is only in India. Mm, uh, right. Most other countries don't have an MCA equivalent. So, you can't just go and get uh, company financials oh, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, okay. And for that matter, even MCA would have a slightly stale data because it's last year's audited uh, numbers. <clears throat> so, it mm. won't have the current numbers. Uh, but but uh, to... every private limited company in India will have to file with MCA last year's audited data. So, that data Absolutely. for India, you can get from MCA. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And there, there are some data providers who do a good job of uh, aggregating data from MCA. So, we kind of ah. would, uh, subscribe okay. to them and take it from there rather than we putting in effort to duplicate that effort. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Got right. it. But and uh, for outside but, India, what do you do? So there are different platforms and then they, um, so like I said earlier that uh, certain parameters are not available. So for example, in certain markets, uh, revenue number is not available. Hmm. So we have built techniques to predict that number basis certain other uh, uh, variables. So so that's like where- headcount or something like that. Uh, so I, I can't talk about that, uh, that here because- I mean- uh, uh, the... But there are a lot of other- uh, hmm. Uh, so we we uh, so again like it is um, uh, uh, it's not just about one one data point uh, uh, the number of uh, data points where we have tried to create proxies and and initially it's about signal which is uh, 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 you know looking at enough uh, data points to get that signal that is this company a likely fit because. Once we determine that it's a likely fit, then we are likely to go and talk to that sell side founder. And in which case, we'll get a lot more recent and a lot more complete data, right? So the buyer, uh, we don't uh, show them a lot of noise. Uh, we do our diligence before we, we you know, go to the buyer saying, hey, this is a very, very interesting uh, fit for you. Mm, okay, okay, understood. So your... Uh team uh, of analysts are uh, essentially screening through uh, your database to identify fits and then doing conversations with companies that are potentially fits and uh, trying to get the additional data to qualify them or disqualify them as the case may be. So there are uh, largely two kinds of people we have. Uh, one are the technologists who are building all this platform and uh, building all the tools and the secret sauce to do all the screening. Uh, the second set of people are the very trained uh, M&A analyst. Uh, uh, it's not just searching, you know, through the platform. It is first mapping the, the buyer's requirements onto certain objectives and certain data points and the models. And then uh, uh, looking at the platform to see which are the uh, companies that fit that. And then they are very trained to talk to the sell side founders. And like I tell uh, uh, you know, all our stakeholders and especially our employees, that this is not a banker talking to uh, another party, right? Like the, the terms used in the banking and the legal world. This is almost like uh, um, you, you know a founder talking to a founder, right? So... So you have to respect the, the founders who have built a company and they may, may or may not want to sell it. They may, may or may not want to sell it right now. So you have to respect all that, right? And, uh, and you have to then talk to them, identify what is it that they want to do. And if they do have interest in exploring, then, uh, 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 then we have to help them also position. Uh, both sides, buyer and seller, it's positioning. In fact, uh, um, we tell our buyer clients, this may be very interesting uh, for you to hear, that uh, we need to sell you to the sellers. Why should yeah, yeah, that seller founder who has spent the uh, last four, five or 10 years building something, this is their baby, why should they sell it to you and then spend the next you know, one, two or three years with you? Right, hmm. uh, and just because you you are a big company, you know, doesn't sometimes it actually could be negative in, in their head. So, hmm. uh, so we really have to 
So these uh, these analysts, they really have to understand both sides really well and articulate the synergies and uh, and then get them together. So They have to bridge the trust gap, basically. Correct, correct. Mm. How do you build uh, this team of analysts? Do you Is there a specific hiring philosophy you're following? Is there a way in which you are uh, making them go through some sort of a training process? Or like, like you know, how, because this team is your revenue generation function is this team only, right? Because their success determines how much revenue you generate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is, that is extremely key. Uh, that is the, you know, that's what we are. Uh, so, of course, technology is what we are, you know, standing on, but uh, it's these analysts who, who make us shine. So, I think in general, my philosophy has been uh, all throughout my 30-odd year uh, career, and I will we'll talk about if you are interested in my journey, uh, but uh, I always look for hunger, that, uh, you know, who's got the uh, hunger to do this? And and uh, one of the things that I've been talking very very uh, kind of I'm very vocal in our all hands uh, uh, which we do every Tuesdays that uh, every single person in the company has to be very well aligned with our vision, right? And we do only one thing, which is the make the M and A happen, uh, the sourcing. So every analyst has to be very very you know. Uh, aligned with that, has to be driven by that, we exist for that, right? So that hunger needs to be there that uh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to find that needle in the haystack and uh, I'll make this, uh, uh, you know, an acquisition happen. And it's a great feeling. Yeah, hunger is, there's no shortage of people with hunger in India. (laughs) That's not (laughs) enough to uh, build your uh, team on. So, so uh, capability plus hunger is still uh, uh, unique. Uh, you don't find it, uh, hmm. you know, so much hmm. out there. So, hmm. so I think what, what I are you looking say, for as capability? Like, okay, so capability side, uh, you know, uh, so a lot of these people have uh, some sort of a finance background. Uh, okay, uh, some of them come from engineering side or other disciplines as well, but they have shown their, uh, uh, you know, their hunger and interest uh, in the uh, finance side, the numbers. And, like uh, they should know how to read a balance sheet? Is that like uh, a, absolutely. one of the requisites? Okay. Absolutely, right. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes you'll find uh, some, you know, so, so yeah, uh, people who come from BCom or MBA or CA kind of background, they have that expertise. But we also have people who from other disciplines. And these are people who have shown their hunger by, you know, spending time in the looking at these companies or maybe even equity markets. And, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's one kid in our team who was spending a lot of time looking at the Bitcoins. And so Mm -hmm. we we don't do anything with that. But, you know, some of those things show us that, yeah, you know, they are, they're not just telling that they are hungry about this domain, but they have made efforts outside of their core domain to learn things. Okay. Okay, understood. So, uh, understanding of finance, ability to read balance sheet plus hunger. Yeah, yes. And maybe like uh, you would need persuasive communication skills also, right? Uh, That's true. And if I could uh, uh, judge uh, empathy for uh, for entrepreneurs or founders, I think that would Mm -hmm. be my uh, very important filter as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Though, yeah, that's hard to... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, once they are hired, then how do you bring them up to speed? We train them. Okay. Okay. And uh, and, and and they work in teams, so we are uh, you know whether whether you like it or not, we are we are not a remote company. Every single mm-hmm. person comes to office five days a week, and uh, so we work in teams, and uh, so these people can learn from other people who have been doing this. Uh, uh, they all of them can come and talk to any one of us. Uh, I sit with them, not in a separate cabin or anything. So we are all very accessible. So there's a lot of training. There's a lot of uh, handholding. Uh, I myself talk to a lot of sell side founders uh, to uh, uh, to give them comfort, to answer a lot of their anxiety. A uh, lot of founders are very anxious. Like they they build a lot of anxiety. Like you know, they don't know. This is the first time they're 
considering to to sell so mm. and what's your head count now uh, so we about uh, 35 people okay and, and what will you close this year at like revenue wise what do you project current uh, financial we sh- uh, we should be hitting uh, uh, just about a million dollars okay okay so your revenue per employee number is really high like with 35 uh, people I think our, uh, our goal is to be uh, higher than that i think the uh, uh, in all honesty i think we are good uh, uh, kind of saas model kind of companies should uh, get to at least $50000 per employee so you know yeah so we we're hoping that by maybe summer of uh, this year we we start to get close to that number Mm, okay okay interesting uh why don't you uh remove the uh the service element of it and make it more saas kind of a product because right now it's uh, a very concierge service which you're offering the, to understand what they need and then do the connections and all uh w- would it uh would there be a bigger opportunity if you were to make it more of a product or is this a bigger opportunity of this concierge offering uh, no no absolutely you you absolutely right i think there's a huge huge global market out there uh, with both buy side and sell side and uh, so we are on to the product journey uh, the but at the same time i've always believed in that you really have to study the problem very very well it's almost like you have to do phd in the problem and then mm-hmm. the right solutions will ultimately emerge right mm-hmm. so we we have taken a lot of effort in uh, spending time with the buyers sellers the whole sourcing and i think we understand it probably now you know better than most people and, uh, and that's how we can build the right uh, product uh, the product is uh, being built which uh, in the past our team has used to service the the clients Uh, i think um, march end we will uh, you know, bring out the the product offering where buyers will be able to do it completely on their own without uh, necessarily engaging our team and soon after that we would uh, do the reverse to the sell side companies uh, because that's the only way to scale and there is a very large uh, uh, in fact there are a number of buyers who have asked us in the last few months and uh, some of those we were not able to take because we did not have the uh, the completely self service uh, saas product so so that is in the works uh, another month and a half uh, we will be in the market uh, do you uh, i mean one of the th- reasons why a buyer would come to you instead of a traction is probably you would have better data right uh, because you would talk to the founder and get the data yeah. um, whereas traction data is whatever is publicly available like through filings etc correct um, if you were to make it a product how, how would you cover that universe of 3 million companies in terms of ensuring that you have that kind of quality data for all of them correct so two ways one is that the on the product itself uh, there there will be so much intelligence to find the very contextual uh, uh, kind of fit and also bringing out a lot of synergies between a pair which is a given buyer and a given seller right yeah, this is not like one to thousands it's one to one right uh, the second part is that uh, like i keep talking about the reverse which is doing this for the the sell side uh, and and i believe like i keep saying that is even a larger opportunity and uh, through that we will have a lot more sell side engaging with us and that is what will make the the data a lot more contextual than just picking up the secondary data mm right 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 yeah if companies start uh, logging on and updating their profile then that's yeah. the dream uh, i mean that's the reason Correct. why someone would pay money to a linkedin because the job yeah. seekers are updating their profile there so correct correct right, right, the, right the the uh, the reason uh, we haven't done it and uh, the reason i think this would be more unique in the market that will keep it extremely discreet so uh, and that's why it's taking longer to to build and uh, so keep it discreet yet get the enough signals from both sides to suggest to both parties that hey here are the the best fits and that there is a likely interest here 
so that intent okay. solving that intent issue is is very critical here okay okay so it will be like a, a company would get a notification that you have received one interest and if they also respond it's kind of like a dating app uh, like if both parties yes, yes. Uh, swipe right only then the details are yeah, revealed yeah, and yeah. the communication starts okay absolutely okay. interesting you say that in fact we have always looked at uh, what we are doing closer to say a, a dating world but it was when I, I i was speaking with you recently you brought out the recruitment okay. side and I said yeah that that is also mm-hmm. you know a very analogous to to what we are doing mm-hmm. okay. interesting interesting yeah. how big is this market that you are building for market uh, just gets bigger and bigger so uh, so from our estimate just the sourcing side of things uh, from a mm-hmm. revenue numbers point of view it's uh, easily over 30 billion dollar market just the sourcing part um, okay and, uh, and and think about it like the if uh, if somebody is looking to spend 10 20 50 million dollars in acquisitions uh, would they spend uh, you know at least one or two percent of that to ensure that they get the best targets and and get a lot lot many number of targets uh, uh, and much, much faster than they otherwise can. Uh, I think that's like a no-brainer. Uh, the, the another thing is, I think there is a big myth in the industry that uh, only large companies do acquisitions because that's what media covers, right? Uh, would you believe if I were to tell you that uh, out of the about 80 some clients that we have serviced so far, uh, three are just Series A uh, uh, companies, but these are buyers. They are paying okay. a subscription to find, uh, uh, you know, uh, sell side companies to acquire. Uh, they are paying us to actively find them, right? They, it's not just a passive thing. So, so I think it's a very, very large uh, market. Uh, venture funded companies, bootstrap companies, public companies, you know, uh, and like I said, these five geographies I talked about, uh, uh, they're all looking at buying in India as well, in addition to, to in their own geographies. Uh, so this cross-border acquisitions, I think this we're we're just scratching the surface. I think that's going to be huge. Uh, I guess uh, traditional Indian businesses are not really like M and A is not really like a very routine thing as much as it is for businesses in the West, right? Uh, do you see that changing that mindset? Absolutely, it's already changing, and and we have uh, clients. In fact. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you the best examples are probably in the consumer world. Uh, just uh, yesterday being a Sunday, I spoke to uh, the uh, uh, one of the founders of a masala company. It's a you know it's mm. a food company. They sell masala masale, right? Mm. Mm. And mm. this is about I think six hundred crores revenue company, and uh, uh, you know they are uh, they you know in my notes I think I have. Uh, at least five areas they mentioned they are they are looking, uh, and and they can go up to uh, forty to fifty crores uh, uh, in in one acquisition, right? And these are as traditional. This is a third generation family business, right? So it's no longer just the tech companies, global companies. I think just you know anybody and everybody. Uh, you need to have a currency. You either need to have cash on the balance sheet or you need to be able to raise a reasonable amount of debt or your equity needs to be a currency that uh, people are willing to take. So you need to have something to be able to uh, make it attractive for the for the seller. But uh, otherwise, I think uh, it's, a, it's a much, much larger market than most people think. What are the reasons for companies to acquire? Like you know, what would make a company want to acquire? Is it to because one obvious thing with cross border M and A is you want to enter a new market. Uh, besides yeah. that, what are the other reasons why companies acquire? So yeah, yeah. So new geography, uh, new vertical, uh, expanding in your own value chain, right? Then getting into adjacent areas. Like a um, couple of years back, almost all the payment companies wanted to get into lending, right? right. So that's not in their own value chain. But in the in the adjacent areas, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, uh, people want to acquire good teams uh, or new capabilities. Like in IT Act services, they're always 
yeah, so Acquihire is there, but a lot of times capability acquisition is a lot more than Acquihire. Like there are IT services companies willing to do 10, 20, 30 million dollar acquisition just purely to acquire capabilities in a in a new area or a, in a, to, to build a new practice. Right. Mm. Uh, sometimes it's to acquire uh, a, a new segment of customers that I've been targeting only enterprise customers. Now I want to get into the next year customers or more SMB, but in the same uh, domain. So there are lots of different reasons people acquire. And but this is this is very, very good, uh, good uh, point, Akshay. The m and is not just about which company is looking in what geography it is what is their motivation, right? If they want to acquire it for an adjacent area versus same value chain versus a new geography versus a good team, the lens that we are going to apply is completely different. And therefore, the what we are going to look for in those companies is completely different, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what makes our, our platform very unique, that uh, we, we are extremely contextual, right? Uh, in in uh, And lots of nuances of it, uh, Mm, understood. Uh, how did you discover this market of m and Like, you know, what is right, the right. reason why you are the founder of GrowthPal? Yeah, yeah. So that is, uh, I, I feel very excited to, to even talk about it. So, um, so I became an entrepreneur the first time in 1998. The, the whole internet was wow. just taking off. Uh, how old were you then? Uh, I was 27 years old. I was in the US. I had just gotten okay. my green card. And okay. uh, I was in the thick of uh, internet uh, world, but on the uh, uh, in the financial services. So I I was working you were working for, for uh, Citibank at that time. I was working for Citibank. Uh, I set up the first uh, internet gateway, the email gateway for Citibank globally in '94. Okay. Uh, okay. So I was in the in the middle of all the uh, emerging technologies, all the new stuff, and. Uh, so I became an entrepreneur and uh, then decided to sell it uh, in about 10 years. So the first well, venture what was, was that? A, what was it, the first venture? Uh, it was actually very similar to what Aadhaar is or the UID. Uh, so this okay. was in the identity and access <clears throat> management uh, domain, which is generally put in the cybersecurity as a larger domain. And... Um, uh, so while I learned a lot while building that business, this was like what say an Okta does, like a secure sign-on. Absolutely, kind of absolutely, a, okay, absolutely. So interestingly, uh, I built the industry's first single sign-on product at Citibank back in '94, '94, '95. Wow. And, and uh, why is this such a big deal? Uh, like you know, why is Okta such a big deal, or why is single sign-on such a big deal? Just help me understand. So it's it's actually a lot more than single sign-on, but the in the digital world, uh, your identity is everything, right? That so to to first ensuring that you say who you are, so to to authenticating you, then to deciding what is it you can do, uh, right? And especially when you're doing a lot of transactions, uh, uh, it becomes extremely important. Right? Today you can transfer, like as individuals, we 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 would transfer, you know, through UPI. Uh, 100 rupees, 1000 rupees, 10,000 rupees. Uh, these corporates and banks, they transfer hundreds of millions of dollars in, uh, you know, in a fraction of a second, just because somebody is claiming who they are, and they have got, you know, the, the uh, authorization or the access rights to do those things. Um, so there's, there's a lot of other things that, that go on there. But uh, it is a big thing. It is a big thing. It's going to become even bigger. Okay. But my, my learnings came actually when I was selling the company. And mm. so so the good thing is that we got... This was a, uh, like a B2B SaaS kind of a play. You were selling to other... Uh, uh, actually, we, we built... Uh, it, was the, uh, it was not a SaaS. We did build uh, a product, but then we had a, uh, a product and services uh, model. So the, the most of the clients were on the services business model. There were few on the pure product uh, uh, business model. And uh, like you would manage the sign-on and access control and authorization for your clients. Right, right. So okay. when we sold, uh, we had actually interestingly, uh, so we had five buyers who were who had made offers, and they ranged from the. Uh, services companies to the big four to the uh, uh, 
publicly listed uh, product companies in the US. And uh, uh, that was a good part. The, the uh, learning or learning part for me was that uh, I learned uh, things that we thought, uh, you know, would get us the maximize the value weren't the things which buyers were valuing on, right? Yeah, like so, give me an example. What do you mean by this? Yeah, so so you know we had built a lot of IP. We had great logos and we had lots of great clients, but smaller revenue from from all of those. Whereas uh, most buyers valued us on EBITDA, right? Uh, so that was a rude awakening that uh, okay, this is how the valuation happens, right? Uh, mm. and again, yeah, and uh, EBITDA is essentially your profit so you were focused yeah. on high quality clients and uh, yes. high quality yes. technology but they were just looking at profit into yeah. certain multiple correct now they became interested in us because we were very ip driven and we had great uh, clients but when it came to the number uh, the valuation there was less very less weight given to those and more on the hardcore profitability and uh, so, so yeah, uh, and and uh, had I, had we known, so I had another partner, Robert. Had we known this uh, even like uh, twelve months before or eighteen months before, we probably would have done things slightly differently and and would have optimized the outcome better. But this is a very common thing I hear from uh, sell side founders that uh, when they come to the table what they're thinking, uh, you know, their value should be is not how buyers are, are valuing. So, so understanding how buyers look at you and, and I don't want to give your audience a, a wrong impression that EBITDA is everything. Uh, again, I, I talked about the different lens you apply depending on what the objective is and uh, what type of targets you're looking at. Depending on that, you look at different ways to value, right? But uh, you as a sell side company, what you're doing and, and understanding who you are likely to be attractive to and how they're going to value you is something that, uh, you know, you should try and understand. Uh, it'll make your ultimately the outcome better. Mm, okay. okay. So anyway, so, so, I, um, so I sold that uh, business in early 2008 and then I moved to uh, India to Pune in 2009 and uh, became a very active investor. So for about seven years, I was very, very active as an angel as well as a couple of uh, VCs. And, uh, but one of the things that kept hitting me was uh, that, uh, where are the exits, hmm. right? Uh, right. They, uh, while they, uh, in those days, like 2010 through probably 15, uh, the, the fundraise used to be extremely difficult, but more and more investors were were jumping into the Indian e ecosystem, and the f the funding ecosystem was getting better and better. Today, it's uh, it's very thriving in India. Uh, however, the exit ecosystem was extremely weak or almost non-existent. Right. So, 2015, I started experimenting with this. Uh, uh, in those days, I was spending. Uh, a uh, good amount of time with IIM Ahmedabad's, uh, the, their venture arm, which used to be called CIAE, now it's called IMA, IMA Ventures. Uh, almost two years I, I worked full time with them. But, so, what was that like an incubator for student yeah, run yeah. ventures? No, it wasn't for students, it was for the uh, startups in the country. It was the largest incubator for startups okay. in, in India. Okay. And uh, yeah, so there. And what does an incubator do? It it gives you like office space and access to a certain suit of services in exchange for equity. Uh, actually, in this case, uh, it was not so much about giving space or taking equity. It was about uh, providing the uh, support system needed to uh, whether it's from uh, finding uh, your uh, getting your pitch ready and positioning in the market to helping you with your first fundraise. Uh, we used to have access to a lot of funds where we would write the first check uh, to even helping them finding co-founders, getting helping them with go to market. So uh, there were a lot of uh, things that, uh, uh, you know, that IMA Ventures uh, provides. So we were doing all of that, but uh, I decided to do my first experiment with this uh, uh, company matchmaking and uh, picked five large uh, corporates uh, in Pune. And for each one of them, we 
picked up their objectives and uh, found the uh, the right companies, got them, got some outcomes there. So that was my first uh, conviction on that. Uh, yes. Which year was this when you ran this? 2015. Uh, one okay. five. Hmm. And uh, since then, I've been on this journey. So it's now uh, almost uh, getting nine years that I've been on this problem. Then I decided to uh, also learn how does a buyer look at things, right? Because I had built a company, sold a company, uh, invested in companies, been on the board of companies, and then sold them to, to other buyers. But I had never been on the buyer side. So I spent a year working with persistent systems uh, uh, on the M&A side to, to look at, uh, okay, uh, now being on the buy side, how do, you, how do you source companies? How do you, you know, do the valuations? Uh, how do you pitch to, to the board? And it was very interesting that uh, as an M&A team, uh, mm-hmm. how we are looking at the, the sell side targets. Then when we go and talk to the business sponsor, how they look at it, then when we make a pitch to the CEO, how does the CEO look at it? And sometimes all of these parties are aligned and, and gung-ho. But when you go and make a pitch to the board, board shots, shots it down, shoots it down, right? So that was great learning to know, you know, buy side is not like one person. It's, it's number of stakeholders. Uh, and immediately after that, then I started GrowthPal in early 2020. So and Persistent is a IT services company in Pune. Th- that's right. That's so, right. So, okay. So you were, uh, so, which is why a lot of your examples were coming about IT services also. Okay. Understood. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so uh, what is, uh, you know, you said that M&A is a $32 billion opportunity. Um Though that's a bit like me saying that recruitment is a 40 billion market. <laughs> and yeah. uh, of that, there are so many players. There, there will be like payroll businesses and there will be like uh, job portals and there will be agencies right. and there will be third party staffing businesses and so on and so right. forth. So what is right. the, how big can growth pile get? Like what is, what, so, what do you have as like a five year roadmap for you and. Correct. So that's what my seed investor, uh, you know, Nagarand has asked me a few times. And so the five-year goal really is that can we build a, a product-led company which can uh, get us to $100 million revenue? Right? That is the dream. That is the, the, that's what we are after. Now, obviously, it has to be in a large uh, market. Uh, otherwise, you know, you can't get to those kind of numbers. And, uh, and and interesting that you you mentioned about that IT services. Actually, today our focus is uh, any tech uh, product uh, domain, so any SaaS company, uh, any fintech, or any IT services. Uh, these are the three uh, primary sectors, and the the fourth sector where we are also big is consumer. And consumer, we are more selective, more uh, kind of new age offerings, more. Uh, people who are also going online and very marketing driven, but these are the D two C D two C. We've had great success. Uh, if I just for one D two C client, we did uh, we closed seven transactions in fifteen months. That's kind of unheard of. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, so so this hundred million is also largely we are saying that these four sectors is where we would keep focused, but we'll increase the geographies. Uh, and the different size of uh, customers. Uh, for example, there is huge demand in manufacturing as well, but we are not touching it uh, at the moment. Okay. Um, who would your customer base be for uh, when you are at 100 million? Like, So right now, it's 100% revenue from buyers. Uh, right. Would How would that change? I think it will be predominant, uh, not predominant, but I would say it would, it would be perhaps... Uh, at least 50, if not, maybe more like 60% from sellers uh, because I think they need a lot more uh, help. And uh, uh, and there, it's not just about selling. See, selling is a, more of an evolution, but uh, in my opinion, every company of any size should always look for strategic partners. And in my mind, definition of a strategic partner is that uh, companies with whom you can go to market with, right? So generally speaking, they are larger than you, who have more access to market than you. Uh, they are in geographies and in the type of clients where you want to get to. 
but you offer something which is complementary to them and it makes like them more Microsoft competitive. And open AI. Absolutely. But if you are a very small startup out of India, then those may be too, too large a company. Uh, but then there are plenty of Series B, Series C, Series D level companies uh, who you could partner with. Where with your product, if they can be more competitive in the market, they will take you to market, right? And you expand your market with that. Uh, in my experience, in the those ten years, in the uh, uh, during I was running my venture, I was there for sixteen years. But my just learnings in the venture world for more for the ten years, I saw that almost fifty percent of the acquisitions happened by the strategic partner, because they already were working with you in the market. They they saw how their customers looked at your product. They saw how their product uh, integrated with yours. They they became comfortable with you as a founder, your team. Uh, so it's very natural for them to, and if your product fits into their product roadmap, it's very natural for them to make an offer to you. And And because the risk is lower for them, because they already know a lot of things about you, the chances of they making a, and higher or more attractive offer are higher, right? And again, this is something I don't see much in India. And I see a lot of founders keep chasing investors, but I don't see enough founders chasing uh, strategic partners. Uh, and uh, in, in in some way, I think it's the uh, it has to do with that our market is not as mature. The larger companies are also not so actively looking for uh, complementary partners. Right? I think most people in India think they can do it on their own. Uh, whereas uh, more mature companies globally, from very beginning, they realize that they can't do everything on their own. And they start building this whole partner network and acquisitions is an outcome of a broader partner channels. Mm. So you would help uh, companies to pitch themselves to larger companies uh, for a small investment plus go-to-market access. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, even today, some of our buyer customers, when we, when we bring them the targets for either acquisition or strategic investment, not every one of those that they like, they are going to be actually able to make an investment or acquire. So then they explore partnerships with them. And okay. we do charge a partnership fee as well if they do close that. Ah. So, Okay. So that is also a, a very large market which can open up for us. Mm, okay, interesting, interesting. And uh, right now you're not selling to investment bankers, right? Th th they would also be a good market for you because yeah, investment yeah. bankers are representing sellers, so so they would want access to buyers. Uh, Absolutely. And and what about PE funds? Like PE funds are essentially buying out businesses. As, do yeah, you? Yeah. Currently, serve PE funds or like those. So we have all we have uh, we started in the last six months so with both uh, selling to investment bankers and private equity. Uh, it was more of uh, we just happened to run into some of these people and they showed a lot of interest. So we got three uh, such clients as of today, and uh, certainly private equity we see a lot of a uh, lot of demand, and we'll start now more actively selling to them. Uh, investment bankers we see as clients, but we also see them as partners because we generally don't do the whole execution of the team. Uh, but there, the larger investment banks, they probably won't see, won't be excited with doing smaller size transactions. But the boutique bankers, uh, we look for them as partners. That uh, the moment we have a buyer interested in a seller, and even as early as thinking of considering an offer. Uh, we would like to get a banker involved if our uh, buyer client is uh, open to engaging them. If not, uh, the the seller should definitely consider, uh, you know, engaging somebody. So, so we we are so in that sense, we are very complementary with uh, investment bankers. We don't see them as competition. Mm, you you become a go to market channel for boutique yeah. investment banks. Absolutely. And would you monetize this uh, because you're bringing them revenues? We'll do revenue share uh, uh, okay. because, see, again, if we're not getting involved in the transaction execution or negotiation, then there's no conflict of interest for us. Uh, mm, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, one uh, last question I wanted to ask you. You know, you said, where are the exits? 
in the Indian ecosystem. Um, yeah. Has that changed? Uh, or Because, you know, recently I've been reading a lot of news and speaking to a lot of people who are saying that increasingly foreign investors are pessimistic about India. And this I'm talking about the VC space, like yeah. uh, early stage Series A, B. They're increasingly Indian capital, Indian family offices are replacing what used to happen with foreign investors and foreign VCs. Uh, so, you know, where do you see that going? Like the, the market for exits uh, or the exit opportunities for founders, how is that evolving? Yeah. I think on the acquisition side, it's the reverse. We are seeing so much demand from non-Indian companies to look in the Indian market, uh, especially for uh, uh, tech world. So the SaaS companies and uh, uh, IT services, these two, we see huge, huge demand. Consumer, a lot less likely. It's more domestic to domestic. And even in fintech, because fintech is more regulated, uh, we're seeing actually a lot of Indian companies looking for acquisitions in Southeast Asia and other markets. Uh, outside companies looking to acquire in India, lesser as compared to, say, SaaS and other domains. But SaaS and IT services, it's like exploding. Almost everybody we talk to, they want to look at India. Interesting. At your 100 million revenue stage, uh, how much of that revenue will be India-based transactions? How much will be global? What do you estimate? Uh, that's, uh, I have not put a number to that. Uh, uh, my guess is that that would be smaller. Uh, it would be perhaps, uh, you know, in the 10 million kind of range. Uh, US will be the predominant. Uh, uh, right. Yeah. Do you have uh, like a direct competitor, someone else who's doing this, like deal sourcing? So we are starting to see uh, now, uh, you know, I don't want to call it, uh, I want to be respectful and not call it noise. Uh, uh, there are a few people I see as, uh, if I can be bold and say noise, but I also see uh, a few players starting to uh, look at this seriously and uh, uh, I think in another, uh, probably uh, by the end of calendar year 2024, I think we'll see more and more players doing this. Uh, because I think clients are certainly now talking more openly that this is a need. Uh, sourcing is a challenge. And uh, so, uh, you know, earlier there was again a myth, okay, if you have a cop dev, then you don't need a sourcing engine. Uh, today, like probably 70% of our clients have a cocktail function and they are actively looking for augmenting, you know, themselves with sourcing. Uh, they, at least 50% of our clients subscribe to some data platform, like, you know, Traction, ECCH or whatever. And they haven't had success on the acquisition front. Uh, it, it, it has, it may have served other purposes. So, so I think people are opening a lot more to, to this uh, uh, late 2020, early 21, when we first started selling, uh, it used to take me a lot of time just to convince them why they even need this. And today, it takes like uh, three minutes to make a pitch and they are sold that, yes, this is needed. Wow. <laughs> now let's get down to that. Uh, can we service their need? And are they willing to pay what we're charging and structuring that, etc. So it's mm. uh, two years I've seen a big change. How much of your time do you spend selling? Uh, the my personal time uh, yes yes uh, so it used to be probably uh, 30 to 40 percent at least earlier mm -hmm. now it's probably down to about uh, maybe 10 percent i spend i spend more time on product and uh, talking to the uh, uh, the sell side founders and at times even the the buy side existing customers uh, to learn what's working, what's not working, 